Travels of the Elis Arbor is an audio narrative set in the world of Bastion using 5e compatible characters. A dark fantasy world with chaos, intrigue, magic, and mystery. The story, setting, and sounds are written by Lonomy and published by Lonomy Creative. Tune in for episode 11, Images. Despite their uninviting and initially hostile welcome, the crew of the Ellis Arbor found some refuge just outside the gates of the Briny Ward Commons, in an outpost known as the Sanctuary. As the last shot was fired and all went silent, barely a sound was heard from the dilapidated cathedral where Darian slew the malefic Adeline. Though the crew were none the wiser as to who or what this creature was. Indeed, she had a face of porcelain beauty and a comely persona. But the blood-stained chambers and scattered remains of humans in the upper floor of the sanctuary told a very different tale. One that Darian, Ed, Carpathian, Newt, and more would rather put behind them. For this was not the first time that our intrepid explorers had dealt with the dangers of occult fascination. Darian himself wielded a weapon known as the Sanguinary Gavel, one that had laid to rest many an accursed beast. As did each and every member of the crew own a weapon powerful enough to stay the forces of evil. Though this particular weapon was less a gift and more a curse of its own. For once, He had bartered away his eternal freedom for the chance at sparing a life. Little did the young, eager captain know that it would follow him, even to the distant shores of Bastion and beyond. Though this time was not for reminiscing on such matters. For once, the crew found a modicum of peace in the bowels of the now unburdened sanctuary of Adeline. They had food, they had beds, and they had a quiet reprieve from the watching eyes of the Melodonian coast. A little over a week, they mulled over their new predicament. Every evening, Moore and Newt took turns, keeping watch from the high northern balcony. And every morning, Darian and Carpathian watched the sun glow over the stone that was the outer walls. They drew very little attention from the town guard only spying a handful of interested faces, gleaning over the towers toward their new home base. It seemed that, even though they had claimed the sanctuary for their own, much of the people of Farreach were not eager to approach this forgotten remnant of a chapel. As Darian pointed, they likely had grown wary of the noises that came from within its walls, and knew better than to try their luck with reclaiming it, even if it did have new caretakers. No, for once, they would be left to their own devices. Every day, as soon as the sun rose, Newt prepared a simple meal out of the rations he scavenged from the upper floor. A veritable stockade of foodstuffs and tinned food would last them long into the next month, if they were acquired. Edwards set to work, claiming a small interior room for his own. From there, he set to work crafting, creating more silver bullets for Darian's pistol, modifying components of Newt's accoutrement, and making incremental adjustments to his own magnificent rifle. Carpathian journeyed through the upper halls of the sanctuary, scrying any remnant of foul incantation or sigil that needed to be dispelled. He found a handful of small inscriptions etched into the wedge of doors and inside cupboards, likely to place a curse on any who bedded in those chambers. Slowly and with meticulous skill, he unraveled spell after spell until the crew were certain of their safety. Adeline, it seemed, had made impressive work of her castle. Protective enchantments, traps and curses were scattered among its many rooms. More, however, wandered after Carpathian, looking for patches of moss and mildew in every corner. Using the magical spores from within their body, they began to nurture and grow these patches into blossoming, blooming flowers. And among them, small red-capped toadstools began to form, growing even from the stone walls where it had eroded. 
And with these mushrooms, they would surely be able to brew and prepare salves for the crew, should they ever need healing. And amongst the bustle of their newfound work, Darien spent most of his days in the quiet corner of a room. He kept to himself where possible, enjoying a meal with the crew in the mornings, before settling in his chambers to gaze through an open window. Though mildew-covered and only semi-translucent, the morning beams of sun would dapple through the room, creating shapes on the floor. As it did, he held the sealed glass bottle aloft. The wax seal upon its stopper seemed to fade from incandescent hues of pink through to deep crimson and wine. And within the bottle, the magnificent model of his pride, the Ellis Arbor, adrift in a tiny model sea. He knew little of how to break the spell that held his ship inside. The mystery of how it came to be still eluded him. And despite his fascination, he knew not or how or why it had appeared so small and so fragile. All he could recall was the night in which it became trapped. The ocean roared in his mind. He could see the waves of crashing crimson brine lapping against the edges of the hull. The blood-stained ocean matched against the ferocity of a lightning storm, a sight which he had never seen. He recalled clutching his blackened amulet to his chest, breathing words to an ancient spell he had once read, though he never recalled completing that incantation. All he knew for certain was waking up upon the shores of Farreach, the Ellis Arbor in its glass cage, and his crew safe from the ire of the Lady of Blood. Though his musings were cut short, on a cold, brisk morning, filled with stagnant air and the lack of tide upon the beach, Carpathian's words began to echo throughout the corridors of the chapel. Look lively. These are figures upon the beach. They look to be armed. Two they are. Captain, best give your orders before I consider summoning fire to our defense. Stay your spells, Carpathian. Best not irritate any more guards. We are now, after all, neighbors to their watch. Perhaps we should prepare for introductions. Darian shuffled out of his room, collecting his hammer and pistol from his bedside. He spotted Edward from across the way, elbows deep in his work and none the wiser of this new occurrence. Ed, grab your weapon and get up somewhere high. If they are here for us, I'd like for you to be in a position to shoot first. Hurriedly, Ed leaned over his workbench, grabbing a red gemstone and placing it into the actuating chamber of Pulse, and he climbed the western tower. A north-facing window would make the perfect vantage point, should he need to offer fire. And so Carpathian and Darien both stepped onto the sands of the Briny Ward, awaiting the approach of their guests. There were two standing shoulder against shoulder and armed to the teeth. Neither Darien nor Carpathian recognized their insignia, but the plate armor and shouldered glaives gave them an appearance of knights. They walked with a determined and gallant stride, unfettered by the soft, rolling sands of the beach. And as they approached, Darien noticed their features in the sun. Peeking through the slits of armor, glistening blue skin, and ears that curved like laurels in sharp, pointed features. He turned to the wizard and whispered, Who are these people? Have you any recollection of seeing them in your time here? Sea Elves, I believe. Melodrin. From what I can recall, they're allied with the Town Guard. But they are an order, all their own. I'm not sure what to make of their coming. And as they approached, one of them began to slow, removing their helmet as they did so. As they rested the polished steel helm on their waist, a mane of silky green hair flowing just behind their shoulder, 
contrasting against a sturdy, featureless brow. And as she approached the steps of the sanctuary, the first knight spoke as the other sunk their glaive a few inches into the sand. Good morning. Our sentry has reported that new residents have taken up the caretaker position of this building. Tell me, pirate, what news of the witch that once plagued this holy place? Stifling a smile, Darien turned toward the elven woman, giving a curt nod as he did so. She is dead, slain by our hand, and her curses cleansed. We've been holed up for the better part of a week, making sure that this holy place was safe for visitors. Tell me, was there a bounty for the witch? Do you have words to share with us? Or can we return to our breakfast? And the other helmeted knight turned to face their companion. They shared a quiet nod before turning toward Darien, the glaive still firmly stuck in the sand. We are knights of the Callow Heart Sanctuary. Years ago, this was a place of worship for our seafaring parishioners before it was overcome by that witch. I believe we have a common purpose here, pirate. Perhaps we should speak more on the matter within the sanctuary. Travels of the El Azaba is made possible by the generous support of our subscribers, followers, and most notably, our patrons. Thanks to Rob Jenkin, Nathan Ebley, and Ensign Turtle for supporting us so far on this journey. Please subscribe, give a like or a comment, follow us on Twitter, and stay tuned for the next episode. Don't forget, take care of each other.